A couple of weeks ago, um, when I uh, preached, I um, talked about what I believe gets at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And I gave you a phrase that, that I hope you all still remember and that I had talked about, and it's a phrase I believe that gets to the heart of everything, and that phrase is that as Christians, love trumps everything. Remember that I was talking about the fact that God doesn't call us to be right. God calls us to be loving. And for a culture that is so consumed with people that need to be right, this message is a critical for one for us to keep in mind. Indeed, lots of people in our society are obsessed with the need to be right, but there is an equally troubling characteristic of our culture today that is really troubling to me and perhaps to many of you as well. And that is that many around us seem to be living with a heart of vindictiveness and a passion for retribution. And while I see people every day doing amazingly, incredibly wonderful, loving, kind, and generous things all the time, it is really not very hard, is it, to find examples of those that have lost sight of compassion, and tenderness, and especially forgiveness. Well, as a result, I want to get into a bit of a heavy subject uh, with you today. It's not a light subject, it's not a fun topic, but it is something that I believe really lies at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Christ. It also is at the heart of our reading today from the letter to the Hebrews. And today I'm actually going to uh, do probably less of a typical uh, uh, Robert sermon and more of, a, more of a teaching, so it's a little bit different. Um, and um, what I want to talk to you about today is the cross of Christ and what it means. And more specifically, I want to talk to you about what it means to be forgiven and what it means to live a forgiven life. And while this subject is far bigger than I can get into in a one-shot deal, I at least want to get into some of the fundamentals with you this morning. And if we want to understand what it means to be forgiven and what living forgiven means, if we want to understand what the cross means, we need not only to go back to the story of creation to understand it, but we also have to go back several thousand years to Jerusalem and Israel and take a look at the cross and forgiveness through very ancient Jewish eyes. So let's begin, and let's begin with the story um, that all of you know, or many of you know, and that is that in the first book of the Bible, that Genesis tells us that God created everything, and um, it's not that we need to get hung up on the details of the book of Genesis, but the main takeaway is that God created everything that there is, and that God's motive for creating everything we see out these windows, and for creating life, and for creating us, God's fundamental bottom line motive was love unselfish love. And scripture tells us that God simply wanted some very basic things in response to being given the gift of life. And what God wanted from us is for us simply to love him back with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul, as it says in the ancient words of the Shema in Jewish scripture. And to put God at the center of our lives and live with a heart of gratitude. And maybe that's a sermon in and of itself, that all God wants from us is to love him back passionately, to put him at the center of our lives, and to live with hearts of gratitude. But I'm going to go on. After God created, though, God had a big problem. And the problem was, is that from the very beginning of creation, people tried to run their own lives without God. Do you know anybody today that does that? <laughs> People tried to put everything at the center of their lives but God. And people asked first, what do I want in life? Not, what does God want for me and from me? And people strayed from a relationship with God and engaged in actions and behaviors that led them away from the one who gave them life to begin with. And the very complicated word for this is sin. Sin is simply acting according to what we want, not what God wants, and putting ourselves and not God first. In fact, I believe that 
despite the goodness that is within so many people, that it is within human nature to sin. You've heard, many of you have heard the term original sin. That's what this means. It simply means our innate tendency to put ourselves ahead of God. St. Paul recognized this problem within himself, his putting himself ahead of God when he wrote, even though I know what I'm supposed to do, there's so many times I do exactly the opposite. He understood that. And the book of Genesis and others in the Bible makes it very clear that God in response to the problem, God's response to the problem of sin was that he was angry with creation. Now God's anger is often misunderstood. I, I see it differently than some people because I believe that any time there is anger underneath it is a deep, profound, poignant hurt. And I believe when you get right down to it, that God was deeply hurt when the people he created began to build their lives around everything but him. And so God had some decisions to make about what to do about this problem of sin and people's desire to do their own thing. And what God did was to create a series of expectations for his people. He created laws to guide his people, to guide his people in their relationship with him. And God's laws were not meant to be mean or narrow-minded. They were meant to give people boundaries so that they wouldn't wander too far away from their creator. Because God knew that without God, there is nothing. If you wander away from God, there is nothing. Without God, there is no life after death. Without God, there's no life itself. The consequence of no God is death. So God created these laws, and you can find them in the Torah and throughout the Old Testament. And this, in part, is why the Old Testament's so hard to read, because there's 613 laws governing, <coughs> governing every nook and cranny of behavior. But after creating laws, God had another big problem. The problem was is that people couldn't stay within the boundaries that he set. They broke the laws. They did not meet God's expectations. They continued to sin, which is, again, putting self ahead of God. So God had some tough decisions to make. He had to decide what to do about the fact that the people continued to sin, even though he laid out clear expectations. Think about the most important relationships in your life. Spouse, parent, child, partner, good friend. Think about that person. And if that person volitionally and intentionally continued to blow you off and not care about you or what you thought or how you felt, how would you feel? It fractures a relationship. And in the same way, sin fractures our relationship with God. It leads a person away from God. So what God did was, is he created this strange-sounding way of making things right between God and people, of putting the relationship between people back on solid footing, of eliminating separation between people and God. God created, and a lot of you know this, some may not, God created a system of atonement, Atonement meaning, meaning to be at one, at one moment. It means to be at one with God. It means putting things back the way that they should be. It means to be in sync with God and with each other. And so God developed this system of atonement through a well-defined system of sacrifice. And if you want to get to it, you need to read what I think is one of the most important chapters in all of Scripture, which is chapter 16 of the book of Levit Leviticus. It's here that this system of atonement is detailed, and it's here that we begin to get a glimpse as to what the cross really means. Well, simply, here's how the system worked in this ancient Jewish system. Once a year, on what was known as the Day of Atonement, the people would gather, as would the priests. Now, the priest would select two animals, two goats, in fact, and one of the goats would be killed. I know this sounds strange, but just bear with me a minute. One of the goats would be killed. The blood of the goat would then be spread all over the altar. The blood would serve as atonement for the sins of the people. Now, why death and why a goat and why all this blood? Well, remember that sin is when we separate ourselves from God. And if we are separate from God, there is no life. We perish. Without God, we die. 
So in this system of atonement, instead of people dying because of sin or from separation from God, a goat would die in their place, a substitute, if you will. And as a result of this Jewish system of substitution, this sacrifice, the effects of people's sins were eliminated forever. There would be no separation from God as a result of sin because an animal died in people's place on their behalf. Now this may seem odd to us, but it's important that we see this system of sacrifice, this Jewish system of sacrifice, is being very ancient, being thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. But also remember that two goats were selected. Remember, one is killed and the other goat. What about the other goat? Well, the other goat was not killed. Instead, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would put his hands on the head of the goat and transfer all of the sins of the people symbolically onto the goat and then kick the goat out and send it into the wilderness. It was known as the scapegoat. So in this Jewish system, on the Day of Atonement, which happened once a year, every year, one animal was sacrificed and killed on behalf of the people, because remember, sin means separation from God and death. One goat was killed on behalf of the people, and the other animal became the people's scapegoat. And when this was done, God said the effects of sin, separation, were eliminated. And this system went on for centuries. But God had a problem again. And we find this problem described in the letter to the Hebrews. And Hebrews is one of the hardest letters in the New Testament because it is deeply rooted in the Old Testament. And you really have to understand the Old Testament to get the letter to the Hebrews. And lots of what we find in the letter to the Hebrews gets back to this Day of Atonement, to this Leviticus chapter. In the letter of Hebrews, we find this verse. In this system of sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year after year, but it is impossible for the blood of goats to take away sins. It is impossible for the blood of a goat to take away sins. Here the writer's talking about atonement. And these passages tell us that despite this system of atonement, the people went on sinning day after day after day, moment after moment after moment, year after year after year. In other words, they continued to separate themselves from God. And without God, remember, there is only no life. So when early Christians who were Jews heard the words to this letter and understood the sacrificial system, heard these words, it's impossible for the blood of goats to take away sins, they would have asked themselves, well, now what on earth do we do? If the blood of goats doesn't take away sin, then what or who will? So God had another decision to make. He became flesh, and he became flesh for lots of reasons that we talk about. But today, I want to highlight that he came, became flesh so that he personally could assume the role of the two goats. He offered himself up to die in our place and to serve as the ultimate scapegoat. And because God, because Jesus, in God in the flesh, died on the cross, the consequences of sin, which is separation from God, are permanently eliminated. No more need for Day of Atonement. So despite our sin, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, nothing can ever separate us from God, not even death. Said another way, you and I are forgiven. No ifs, ands, or buts. Whatever, whatever you've done, in your past, you are forgiven. That's what the cross means. That's what the letter of the Hebrew means. So just for a couple of minutes, I just want to ask the question, if we are forgiven, so what? What does that mean? How are we supposed to live our lives? How are we supposed to think about the cross? What does a forgiven life look like? Well, let me just touch on a few ideas. First, if we take the cross seriously, it means that burdens from the past we're going to let go of. Whatever burdens we are carrying around, the cross says, let go of them. 
Let go of it. Just let it go. It means, the cross means that those tapes that play around in our head that mess with us from the past, whether from relationships that didn't work out or parents or whatever, wherever they come from, they get us hung up and cause us to project stuff onto people and get us hung up. The cross says, erase those darn tapes. Stop it. There's no reason to play them anymore. The cross means that we will look at today not through the lenses of yesterday. It means stop carrying around the pains, hurts, failures, and disappointments of what was, and be very careful about how you invest your emotional and spiritual energy right now. Not on the past, but on right now. As I say this, so I want you to know this is really hard to do. I have a brutal time letting go of some stuff. I have a really difficult time erasing some of those tapes. And when I am in those places, I talk to God. God, help me to erase those tapes, set down those suitcases of baggage, let go, and move on. Secondly, to live forgiven means that we're going to act forgiven. It means we're not going to act badly. <laughs> forgiven people don't act poorly. When we know we are forgiven, our behavior changes, our actions change. And we work hard on moving beyond old ways of behaving. In my newsletter this week, I wrote about this, but I was recently on an airplane. I saw some really bad behavior. One guy complained during the whole flight. Another woman dropped a laptop computer on a woman's head and didn't say I'm sorry. Another man pushes way all the way up through the aisle. And just as I was about to say something to these three people, I heard a voice in my head that said, Robert, you are forgiven. Live it. Show it. Demonstrate it. Third, and this is hard, living forgiven means to live with a forgiving heart towards others. To keep in mind that if we are forgiven, whether we like it or not, so is everybody else. So is everybody else. Now, because we're forgiven, it doesn't mean we should do anything we want to. Doesn't mean that every behavior is okay. Doesn't mean that we should do horrendous things. Somebody even asked St. Paul one day, and they said, Paul, because we're forgiven, does that mean we can do anything we want to do? You know what Paul says in Greek? He says, hell no. That's <laughs> what he says in Greek. That's not what I mean at all. Because you're forgiven, your behavior changes. You don't do things that are bad. It means you go living through life with a forgiving heart. Just a couple more here. Fourth, to live forgiven means that we keep in mind that faith is all about relationship. Relationship with God and with people. When Jesus died on that cross, that whole complicated system of atonement went out the window. Going to a temple once a year didn't matter anymore. Living forgiven means that we know that our walk with God is not about a place like a building or a temple. Faith is not about a bunch of rituals we do over and over and over again. Faith is not a building about a building. Faith is not about form. Faith is about relationship. And fifth, living forgiven means we accept and believe that nothing separates us from God or can. Nothing. We may feel separate from God, but we're not. Nothing can separate us from God. Whereas Paul writes in Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing, not even death. God is right here. His, Hebrews, his letter to the Hebrews says, God is actually carved into our hearts. That's how close God is. And finally, living forgiven means that no matter what, and no matter how bad things look, we trust that God's plan will win out in the end. Remember the story. God created. We walked away. God came up with laws. We walked away. God came up with a sacrificial system. We walked away. So Jesus died on the cross and fixed the problem. God's plan wins out in the end, always. No matter what we do. No matter what we do or don't do, God's plan wins out in the end, and the plan is about each of us being with God and each other today, tomorrow, and for eternity. So this cross thing, it's complicated on some levels, it's mysterious on some levels, 
But I hope that you will think about this stuff, that you'll talk about it with each other, you'll struggle with it, you'll ponder it, you'll pray about it. And think about what it would be like if more people took forgiveness seriously. If more people took living forgiving, forgiven seriously. What would happen to vindictiveness? What would happen to retribution? And how might we learn to see ourselves and others differently if we saw everything through the cross of Christ? Let us pray.